Dr. Reddy and Dr. Shah and the uh, uh, organizers for inviting me. Um, so let me share my screen. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, you know, had uh, experience with many different things, but at heart, uh, of course, uh, remain an Indian at heart. In fact, uh, I'm presenting today in, in New Delhi. So I just arrived yesterday. Uh, it's great to be back after a gap of two years. Uh, thankfully, this uh, COVID thing is, uh, is uh, at least, uh, you know, it's getting a little better. Let's hope, uh, hope for the best uh, that, that, then, that we don't have to deal with another, another wave anywhere in the world, in fact, right? So, so with that hope, uh, uh, let me start with this, uh, which is uh, glucose lowering strategies for cardioprotective uh, benefits. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on pathophysiological mechanisms. So I'm not going to focus on clinical trial data, which has already been presented here in this Incretin symposium, as well as other symposia uh, that you've likely attended. I'll focus on uh, how that may correlate to pathophysiological mechanisms and whether that has maybe any clinical uh, relevance or not. I'm a clinician at heart. Uh, I do uh, phase two, three, four uh, research studies. Uh, but then again, uh, I'm a clinician heart, at heart, and that's how I think about uh, when I present as well. Here's my disclosures. Um, so some of the disclosures were already discussed. Uh, uh, there's some research funding to my institution. I don't uh, do any consulting or advisory board uh, work. Um, I, I have um, I've been a part of, uh, as a PI, of several outcome trials, cardiovascular outcome trials, I'm also a national leader of, in Canada for a few cardiovascular outcome trials, which are at the bottom. Here's the outline of how I'm going to go about uh, over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll, I'll briefly mention how cardiovascular outcome trials in type 2 diabetes have transformed the guidelines, uh, diabetes guidelines, uh, where the focus has shifted to reduction of complications. So it's no longer just a glucose number that we are worried about, but about reduction of complications, especially uh, macrovascular complications or MACE complications, as we say it, and also kidney disease uh, complications and heart failure as well. As a previous speaker alluded to, uh, we must not forget what we've learned in the past, though. And one of the things that remains paramount for diabetes management, despite this shift of diabetes uh, um, uh, management strategies, one of the things that remains the gold standard is still the multifactorial intervention or diabetes management, uh, which comes from Steno2 trial, which I'll briefly mention. And then, um, as I said, most of the uh, comments will be focused on the pathophysiological mechanisms for cardiac uh, benefits of uh, some of these diabetes uh, management strategies. Uh, we'll talk about early diabetes as well as late diabetes and, and what may be the mechanisms at play. I wanna start uh, with, the, with the thing that I said remains paramount, which is multifactorial diabetes management. So multifactorial approach to diabetes remains the cornerstone. Uh, and this was entrenched uh, from the Steno2 trial, which talked about not just glycemic control in type two diabetes, but also lifestyle modification, blood pressure control, management of dyslipidemia and platelet inhibition uh, when it is necessary. So all those are the key components of the multifactorial diabetes management that should be continued and are still relevant and are still recommended in, in each and every guideline that we talk about, whether it is the American guideline or the European guideline or the, or the Can Canadian guideline as well. Steno2 was an interesting uh, small study. Here's the main results of the Steno2 study from all those multifactorial approaches. Uh, the risk reduction that you're watching uh, on this graph is cardiovascular events that were reduced about 60%, which is astounding, especially given that this study was published about 15 years ago uh, when we didn't uh, have much in regards to reduction of cardiovascular complications at least uh, not uh, uh, you know, beyond statins uh, or, or RAS inhibitors, we didn't have much data on this 60% reduction was a huge thing. Well, what's even more um, enormous, I would say, is this 21 year uh, follow-up of the Steno2 trial, which was published a few years ago. And I'll not go through the whole data, but what it shows is that the number needed to treat for people with type two diabetes with this multifactorial intervention 
to prevent one death is just under five people. So if we can, we can treat five people with multifactorial approaches, we can actually prevent or delay, I should say, you can never prevent death. Everybody has to die someday, but at least you can delay over the 21 years, one death uh, during that 21 years. Uh, the difference in median survival was about eight years in this uh, follow-up. You know, we often say about 10 to 15 years of uh, life is taken away if, you, if somebody gets diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and about uh, eight years is what is given back, uh, at least with multifactorial intervention. That's what this uh, study shows. A few years ago, uh, me and Dr. Zinman, uh, Dr. Bernie Zinman, I'm not sure how many of you have heard, uh, had the opportunity to hear uh, him. He's my mentor at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, world-renowned endocrinologist, uh, etc. Um, so we had a, uh, we have written a few uh, reviews uh, in in various um, um, various uh, journals. Uh, this was a review in uh, in Physiology Journal about the cardiovascular intervention trials in diabetes. And so this is one of the graphs from that. Of course, uh, what you see is a forest plot. Uh, there's two forest plots uh, side by side. One is all-cause mortality. And the other is incident cardiovascular disease, uh, as you can see. So, um, uh, and, and what we're presenting is uh, the long-term data on different trials in this, uh, in this forest plots. So as you can see, Steno2, the 21-year follow-up shows all-cause mortality reduction, incident cardiovascular events reduction. Even the 13-year data suggested the same thing. But when we actually look at each of these factors or each of these interventions, uh, separately or one by one, we don't see all of them falling into place, especially glucose lowering intervention trials have, if anything, been, been on, the, uh, in, on the wrong side, especially if we think about a core trial, we know that uh, the mortality in a core trial was increased. But if you looked at the long-term data, there is some suggestion that there may be some benefit on all-cause mortality incident cardiovascular events, but not within the trial itself. Um, and that's uh, interesting to think, uh, maybe it's the long-term glucose control that matters. Uh, and that's why some people have commented on the legacy effect, uh, which uh, Dr. Zinman is a, is a big proponent of as well. And then if we look at the other strategies, interventions, uh, so BP and LDL uh, cholesterol, so BP uh, trials, a core BP trial, advanced BP trial, the long-term uh, uh, long follow-ups uh, suggest maybe possibility of benefit, uh, but again, uh, not, uh, not very um, consistently as such. In CARDS, uh, which was uh, uh, a lipid-lowering um, uh, statin uh, trial in people with type 2 diabetes, uh, there was a, a reduction uh, which was there in incident cardiovascular events but not significant for all cause mortality. And then um, uh, how about the Holy Grail, which is uh, intensive lifestyle intervention or uh, lifestyle modification. The look ahead trial, of course, did not show a reduction in cardiovascular events or in all cause mortality. So that's the whole picture, the big picture. If we look at multifactorial interventions, yes, they work, but individual strategies, at least in trials, um, we have not been able to show that consistently. Uh, in some long-term follow-ups we have, but not consistently within the trials, uh, within the UK PDS Accord and Advance, for example, in glucose lowering trials, you were not able to show the benefits. Um, so if you were to look at the evolution of type 2 diabetes management uh, after metformin and, and lifestyle modification, if we were uh, practicing uh, medicine uh, in pre-2000 era, uh, when we had only sulfonylurea and insulin, uh, our only target at that time or goal was hemoglobin A1C or glucose lowering, and the lower is better is what the thought was. Then came the core trial and other trials that suggested maybe avoiding hypoglycemia is important as well. And then we had certain drugs like the thiazolidine diones as well as GPP-4 inhibitors in the 2000s uh, in that decade or so. Uh, which um, we used uh, quite a bit because uh, we, uh, the guidelines suggested that the A1C lowering was important, but it may not be better. Uh, the lower may not be better for everyone, and we may have to fine tune or maybe tailor the approach of A1C target uh, to the patient that we are treating, as well as while avoiding hypoglycemia. Um, 
And then over the last seven years, since 2015, the first uh, trial that was positive was Emporeg outcome with empaglifosin. And since then, we've had several, several trials uh, with GLP-1 receptor agonists, as well as SGLT-2 inhibitors, which have uh, consistently almost shown a reduction in either the MACE or the heart failure outcomes or the kidney disease uh, outcomes as well. Uh, so that has become the paramount goal uh, in, in guidelines while also still uh, recognizing A1C individualized targets, avoiding hypoglycemia, and of course, multifactorial intervention. For example, here's the 2021 ADA um, uh, guideline table. It's a complicated table. I'll just focus on this, uh, on this uh, left part of the, of the equation, which talks about uh, whether the patient has high risk uh, uh, for cardiovascular disease. So not established, but uh, any high-risk features, more than two high-risk features, which most of the patients do have, or established uh, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, or uh, uh, heart failure. So in this uh, part of the table, uh, the ADA guidelines suggest consider independently of baseline A1C, even if the A1C is less than 7%, which is generally the target, or independent of the metformin use, whether you're using metformin or not, we should consider cardioprotective or heart failure protective or kidney disease protective strategies, which should either be a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT-2 inhibitor, uh, depending on the case, uh, if it's dealing with heart failure, SGLT-2 inhibitor, if it's dealing with kidney disease, SGLT2 inhibitor is preferred, but GLP-1 have shown cardiovascular benefit in kidney disease patients as well. So that can be an alternative. In people with previous cardiovascular disease or people uh, with indicators of high risk without cardiovascular disease, a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist or an SGLT2 is uh, recommended. So that's uh, uh, how the guidelines have changed. As I mentioned, EMPA-REG outcome was the first one. And then came Canvas. Uh, you're all familiar with this data. What I'm showing, of course, is the forest plots of the primary outcome, the MACE outcome, as well as uh, 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 the components of that primary outcome, the MACE. So MACE includes CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. And, um, and as you can see in EMPA-REG outcome, CV death was uh, significantly reduced in addition to the MACE outcome. Now, these two trials had a majority of the people with a broken heart. And I don't say it in a light uh, terms, uh, I don't say it in any other means, but to say that somebody who's had established cardiovascular disease and the heart is actually uh, damaged from before. So it's not a normal heart. Um, so we, don't, we didn't know about uh, whether similar benefit on MACE exists or not uh, on people who have no previous cardiovascular disease history uh, and have diabetes. So that was tested in the DECLARE trial with, um, in which uh, only about 40% of the 17,000 people had cardiovascular disease, and that showed a neutral MACE. It did not show a, a MACE uh, protection, and that's why we can say clearly that um, there, there is cardioprotection or MACE protection at least in people with previous cardiovascular disease with diabetes, but not in those who don't have previous cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is also clear from this uh, meta-analysis. Um, it's, a, it's a couple of years uh, old now, uh, but then again, uh, it, it clearly portrays that message that MACE reduction is there in ASCVD patients, as we can see in this top part. But in people without ASCVD, there's no MACE reduction. As you can see, uh, the hazard ratio is 1.0, so there's no MACE reduction if you look at that. On the other hand, if you look at the heart failure uh, outcome, uh, there is reduction in heart failure outcomes uh, in, in people without uh, and with uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, if we talk about uh, uh, people without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease history, the number needed to treat is uh, for reduction of heart failure is about 142 people that you need to treat over four years to prevent one, one hospitalization for heart failure. So then it becomes a cost effectiveness uh, um, uh, you know, decision whether, uh, whether an SGLT2 inhibitor should be used in that scenario uh, when we are looking at that number you need to treat. Uh, and that's a cost equation and it varies from country to country as well. So that's the SGLT2 inhibitors. How about the GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, trials? So here's um, uh, all the trials uh, that have been published, all eight trials. 
and the ones in green have been positive. The ones in blue have been neutral. Um, uh, so the primary outcome of MACE was neutral. So the positive uh, trials were leader with liraglutide, sustain six with semaglutide, harmony with albiglutide, and then rewind with uh, dilaglutide. And they've significantly shown a reduction. If you do a meta-analysis or you look at uh, you know, all the GLP-1 receptor agonists in a forest plot, which I'm showing you here, you can see all of them are almost all are towards the, the left of unity. Uh, Elixa is lexisenatide, and that was a different kind of trial in people with acute coronary syndrome, not uh, established cardiovascular disease, and that uh, should, should be uh, taken separately. Let me show you the graph on the rewind trial. Why? Because uh, out of all these trials, um, all of these trials except rewind had a majority of the people with previous cardiovascular disease. So we talked about how SGLT2 inhibitors have shown benefit on heart failure, but not on MACE in people without cardiovascular disease history. However, in Rewind, uh, where, uh, where about 60% of people uh, were with, uh, without cardiovascular disease history, this was the MACE outcome was positive, and it was similarly positive in people with and without cardiovascular disease. So we can clearly say from this uh, trial results that GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, which is opposite of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, they can actually, uh, they actually reduce cardiovascular events, MACE events in uh, people with and without cardiovascular disease. So that's the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now let's put this all together in a pathophysiological way and talk about the, uh, the coronary arteries and how atherosclerosis and heart failure uh, develops in the heart. So let's talk about the heart itself. Uh, we know that um, uh, the first uh, kind of uh, uh, changes that happen is foam cells and a fatty streak, then an intermediate lesion happens, and then the atheroma uh, starts to develop. And, in, and that happens in early diabetes in most of the people uh, when they're early in their disease. Of course, it's asymptomatic at that point. So in the table below, you can see the different interventions that we've been talking about and how in early diabetes, they may affect atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease over time or heart failure over time. And the number of pluses is just signifying how much effect there is. If there's more plus, then there is more benefit. If it's zero or minus, then uh, it's neutral or negative effect is what that suggests. Or plus minus questionnaire question is basically we don't know enough uh, data. And this uh, is also from the same review article uh, back in 2018 uh, that me and Dr. Zinman wrote. And this was prior to declare TIMI and prior to rewind trial results as well. So declare and uh, rewind actually, actually prove or suggest that this uh, uh, table may actually be okay uh, uh, even to this uh, date. So what, this, uh, what we suggested was, Okay, uh, in early diabetes, A1C lowering, blood pressure lowering, LDL lowering, and of course, multifactorial interventions remain important uh, to prevent cardiovascular disease, but not so much for heart failure. And then the other interventions like aspirin, RAS blockers are somewhat important, uh, RAS blockers especially, but aspirin is uh, plus or minus. Beta blockers are not important in, in terms of uh, early diabetes and primary prevention as such. ILI is into uh, intensive lifestyle interventions, uh, and that, at least from look ahead, if you look at people without cardiovascular disease in look ahead study in, in lifestyle intervention, uh, they did, did see a, dif uh, a difference in terms of cardiovascular protection, and that's why we gave it a one plus, uh, so small effect, but uh, possibly there. And then when we look at GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, that's what we've discussed, that in early diabetes or primary prevention, people without previous cardiovascular disease history, we see an effect from GLP-1 receptor agonist in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease or atherosclerotic uh, disease, but not with SGLT2 inhibitors. And there may be some effect uh, of SGLT2 inhibitors on heart failure, on the other hand, which is not there with GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then let's move the story forward to late diabetes and when the plaque is uh, further along. So uh, we know that atheroma becomes a fibrous plaque and that ruptures and that uh, causes, uh, causes an MI, et cetera. And so in late diabetes, the strategies, uh, same way, um, you know, the strategies do work. In, in fact, aspirin is recommended, beta blockers are recommended, 
in people with uh, previous cardiovascular disease uh, history as such. GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors are both recommended as we saw in the ADA guideline as well. Now in heart failure, there is a separate story because uh, many of these uh, medications actually have more effects. So blood pressure lowering, um, RAS blockers are more important, beta blockers are more important, as well as SGLT2 inhibitors uh, may become more important uh, as uh, with somebody in somebody who has previous uh, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, and late diabetes, then SGLT2 inhibitors may actually have a larger role to play in terms of heart failure protection. Now, when we talk about heart failure, we must remember it's not just, uh, not just a systolic dysfunction, as we used to call it, or a reduced ejection fraction heart failure that we're talking about, but also the preserved ejection fraction heart failure or diastolic dysfunction means the coronary arteries are still intact. They're still supplying the heart, but then because of other disturbances, whether metabolic disturbances or other neurohormonal activation, et cetera, there is development of hypertensive cardiomyopathy or diabetic cardiomyopathy, which leads to heart failure syndrome, uh, even without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So that's also important to uh, recognize that heart failure is not just uh, due to uh, atherosclerosis uh, as such as well. So that's the pathophysiology, if you will, of all those different interventions. Now, again, coming back to our, our two uh, kids on the block, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, that we've been talking about, if we discuss the mechanisms that have been postulated for SGLT2 inhibitors, here are some of the uh, postulated hypotheses that have come out. Uh, the ma majority of the uh, gurus, if you will, of endocrinology believe the volume or the fluid balance uh, mechanism uh, hypothesis, which basically may have to do with the, with, the, with the volume contraction. But this may not be as simple as just intravascular volume, but also extracellular fluid volume and the redistribution of that as well. So maybe that uh, changes the Starling's curve in the heart, and that uh, leads to better heart um, uh, functioning, as well as uh, <clears throat> better efficiency in the heart. Uh, hence protecting the heart. The second mechanism deals with the ketone body as a caloric fuel. So we know SGLT2 inhibitors lead to ketonemia and ketone bodies may be a better fuel for the heart, a more efficient fuel for the heart um, to use uh, to produce uh, its energy rather than fatty acid or glucose. And that's uh, another mechanism that has been postulated. Other mechanisms have been postulated. Some of them are not even listed and these include uh, increased hematocrit. Maybe there is a restoration of normal di diurnal meta metabolism in terms of nocturnal catabolism, means in the night with SGLT2 inhibitors, people pee out or urinate out the calories, and hence uh, in, in the night, they are actually catabolic, which is normal, and that's uh, possibly leading to the benefit. And there's also a postulated mechanism around the sodium hydrogen, hydrogen exchanger, uh, which uh, may lead to differential or less accumulation of sodium and calcium in the cardiomyocyte, uh, which may be protective as well. That's for SGLT2 inhibitors. For GLP-1 receptor agonists, it seems uh, everybody, uh, almost everybody agrees that it has to do with atherosclerosis, whether it's a direct effect, uh, unlikely, but it, it may be uh, related to various uh, inflammatory things that uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists do is what is believed. But of course, these are hypotheses uh, that have been postulated. In uh, the pathophysiology uh, uh, review that we wrote, uh, me and Dr. Zinman in physiology a couple of years ago, we also uh, wrote about a possible uh, unifying mechanism for all the cardiovascular um, uh, protective glucose lowering strategies. And we call this the caloric fuel routing hypothesis. So maybe it's the caloric fuel that needs to be really rerouted in a different way that leads to the cardiovascular benefit. Let me explain uh, what, what we mean by that. So here we are talking about different strategies. Uh, so we, can, we are talking about Mediterranean diet, uh, ILI, which is intensive lifestyle intervention, GLP-1 receptor agonist, and bariatric surgery. And how they work, they might work, is by reducing caloric intake or by affecting the nutrition balance or absorption of the food itself. So through the mouth, going into the stomach, and then the small intestine, 
And of course, the liver is involved with that part. So that's the calorie routing uh, in this part uh, that may be relevant. And then um, metformin in some studies, uh, UKPDS being one, has been suggested to be cardiovascular protective. How metformin works is through muscles, heart and liver, and strategies targeting AMPK, uh, with, which uh, lead to cellular fuel gauge uh, change may be relevant uh, in that. In terms of uh, thiazolidine diones, uh, they may be uh, stimulating storage of caloric fuel within the fat cells. And so that um, basically means taking fat out of other organs and putting into fat cells and hence rerouting the calories uh, in that. And that may be cardioprotective as well. And then SEL2 inhibitors in a simple way, what they do is they, they excrete calories in the urine and hence uh, they may affect um, the caloric uh, balance by just excreting out uh, the portions as such. So uh, if we all put this all together, this is the caloric uh, routing hypothesis that we postulated that it has to do with the caloric balance or rebalance or redistribution uh, that goes on with any of these cardioprotective um, strategies. And that may be something to consider. Again, a hypothesis uh, that has been postulated, uh, nothing proven as such, right? So I'll, I'll just summarize and end uh, and happy to answer any questions. Uh, so the summary is, yes, we don't know the mechanisms of cardiac benefits. However, what we know uh, for now is uh, all of these uh, you know, mechanisms may be partly playing a role, et cetera. But what is important and clear is the guidelines have changed uh, to prevention of diabetes complications as the paramount goal of therapy multifactorial interventions, uh, which uh, focus on macrovascular complication reduction uh, with a Steno2 trial may actually extend lives, extend the lives of, the, of your patients by eight years. So make sure that that remains paramount. And then GLP-1 receptor agonists have profound MACE benefit, which, is, uh, which deals with atherosclerosis. And Rewind suggests that this benefit is actually there in people who have high risk, but without cardiovascular disease as well. Whereas on the other hand, SEL2 inhibitors, they also have profound benefit, but on heart failure side and renal side, less on the MACE, especially in that patient who does not have cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is the bottom line, I think, um, at least uh, to this uh, date, that type two diabetes management should be a combination of two things, which remains a multifactorial intervention, the Steno2 type interventions, plus whatever you think is appropriate cardiovascular protective uh, diabetes medicines uh, for the patient as well. So I'll stop sharing and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.